Okay, this is hey. that moment when we're actually live, but it doesn't say we're live yet. <laughs> How do I always say it? Let us know. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know, right? Okay. Uh, um, okay, here we are. Yeah. It's 7 o'clock Sunday evening. Uh, we're going to be reading. Um, here's it soon. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, then, we're competing with the Seahawks tonight, yeah, so yeah, hello. Hello, is anybody out there? <laughs> Probably not. And, now, and yeah, that's, that's all right because yeah. these work um, listening to later. So yeah. Yeah. that's actually where we get most of our visits is yeah. later. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this has been a, a scary week. <laughs> yeah. yeah our, um, um, our oldest daughter, Ninette, um, just recently spent a weekend at uh, their, uh, her vacation home in Chelan with her little sister, Stephanie, and Wednesday, and that was uh, diagnosed as positive with the COVID-19 virus, mm -hmm. which two families <laughs> Were could be really hardly hit, or yeah, and this is a scary thing. But we have found out uh, since mm -hmm. then that Nanette, this is, I guess, it's good news. Nanette's the only one that's been um, positive, everyone else has been um, negative. So that's yeah, the that's relief, and it's a god deal. And we thank him for yeah. taking care. All right. So anybody who listens to this, mm -hmm. um, we'd appreciate prayers for Nanette. Yeah. Um, so far, the symptoms have been mild, but we understand that that can change. Yeah. <coughs> and so we're hoping um, that things change soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that... Um, when we started this reading, it was the first week of the quarantine and, and COVID had just come out. And um, it's kind of sad that, you know, we're almost to the end of the book and and now it's affecting our own family in a yeah. very big way. And so... Yeah. Yeah. So... Uh, um, we certainly didn't think that's where we were going when this first started. Yeah. <laughs> So we're going to be reading from our book, In Spite of Us, a love story about second chances, chapters 51 and 52. Um, um, our, uh, our book's available in any bookstore. You can order it. Uh, you can check it out at the local library here near Yakima. And, uh, Available mm -hmm. at Amazon. Amazon, yeah, Barnes and Noble. Yeah. So I uh, um, hope you're with us tonight. And Deb's going to be reading real soon. And before that, I'm going to read a review of our book. That uh, This review is an Amazon review. It uh, was written by Patty. I confess, I am a picky reader. I have certain standards. I want entertainment, but I want to go deep, too. I want some fun and romance. And I want the real nitty-gritty of life. Deb and Sandy's book has it all. They are hilarious. And Deb's creative and crazy schemes remind me of Lucille Ball, and I love Lucy. <laughs> Redhead, too. <laughs> I threw that in that one. <laughs> I am not kidding. She is so funny. And Sandy's deadpan reactions to her make me and my husband laugh out loud. In fact, this is one of the few books that both Mike and I wanted to read out loud to each other. In spite of the Palmer's best efforts to avoid God, something hits home that opens an unexpected window of hope and beauty. This story also digs deep into that bizarre land of an alcoholic's denial. 
Deb is brutally honest about the mental gymnastics she performed in order to deny her alcoholism. In spite of the denial and craziness, there is hope. The subtitle says it all. A love story about second chances. Thank you for that. Yeah. Review, Patty. Yeah. <laughs> So, without further ado... So, if I'm Lucy, you're Desi. Let's hear your best babaloo. <laughs> babaloo! <laughs> <laughs> oh, you need to work on that, dear. <laughs> okay, so, um, my chapter tonight, chapter 51, deals with my mother's funeral. Um, but more so, it's the beginning of grief that lasts well over 10 years. And, you know... It's only been recently that I, um, <laughs> Mark is telling us that he doesn't have any sound. <laughs> I don't think we could do anything about that, oh. Mark. <laughs> Listen louder. Yeah. <laughs> do you have your hearing aids in, Mark? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, read, Mark. I read lips. I'm, bl I'm deaf too. <laughs> <laughs> Mark is Sandy's brother. Um, <laughs> Oh, I got to put something in here yeah. anyway, and yeah. then um, just one second. Sorry, folks. I got a little off oh, track it came there. Back. Okay. <laughs> good job. Yeah. Good job, Mark. We're whole family techies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You. Oh boy. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I got to get back to this now. <laughs> okay. So my chapter deals with my mother's funeral. But um, just recently, I, I realized that, you know, the grief was so long for my mother. And, but that's partly because um, we couldn't just mourn our mother's death and move on because all of all the grief and drama that our dad was putting us through. Um, and he was completely out of control. The family home um, was being foreclosed on. And remember, he lives across the street from the Muckleshoot Casino. He's getting robbed on a regular basis. There's female predators circling his semi-warm body. Mm -hmm. I'm calling him daily and doing my best to live in forgiveness. Um, I think it would be fair to say I was probably failing at that daily as well. That's only possible at all because of the healing um, that's, that was in progress as a result of a ministry at our church called um, Surrendered Hearts. And Evan, our grandson, who's now 22 years old, is um, at this period in the book is going to church with me every week. Um, and I think it's fair to say that at this stage in the book, which we're almost to the end, <laughs> the renovation that God has done on me is beginning to show. Okay, so my chapter, chapter 51, called, After All, I Denied Him More Than Once. As a child, I tricked the world into believing I was different by choice. Hidden deep in my soul, I kept a secret. I longed to be normal. Our photograph was not the one in the new wallet representing the American dream, but rather the one representing the behind closed doors family. Mom worked hard painting the illusion of normal on our faces whenever we walked out the door. Normal. That's what I want for my mother's funeral. It's what she would want. A pastor in a suit to say nice things. A church with family and friends sharing great stories and tears. Personally, I hate funerals. Whatever delusion supports the logic of this bizarre event, I don't understand. We pay to have our loved one pumped full of chemicals, painted and coiffed like a wax museum doll. We gently place their head on a satin pillow, crisscrossing their hands across their lap. Then it gets really weird. 
We dragged the body to the church and prayed by the coffin, explaining how peaceful, at rest, and serene they look. No one speaks up saying the truth. Whoa, who did this? Makeup does not hide dead. Thank God our family agreed mom would have chosen a closed casket. Still, we stuffed her body in an expensive satin lined box and dragged her to church. From there, finding normal is challenging. Over the years, my parents moved up the ladder of the fraternal order, elks to moose to eagles. In these orders, with each rung, the drinking progresses. By the time the top rung is climbed, many have either hopped on the sobriety wagon or died of liver failure. The last man standing represents Darwin's theory for the survival of the fittest. As such, most or all mom's friends have already been pumped, boxed, and dragged to church years ago. Knowing this, we kept the arrangements simple. Nevertheless, a normal service was doomed from the start. With the family seated to the side behind a curtain, less than 10 people were left in the pews. The pastor, who'd never met mom, stands and fumbles with the sound equipment. Wrapping his fingers around the microphone, Vegas style, channeling Elvis, he sings, Love Me Tender. The curtain serves as a veil for the eyes, but not the tear ears. As he impersonates the king, I remind myself that we all agreed to this. The pastor rewrote the songs to include Jesus, yet somehow the idea played better in our heads than live here in Viva La Funeral. Once again, the McFarlands fail at normal. With Haley at my side, prepared to stand in if I fell apart, I read a short eulogy to the few in the pews. Then it was back to Viva Las Vegas or maybe Heartbreak Hotel. At some point, the pastor asked if anyone would like to say a few words. A woman stood up and called out. Dima was a beautiful woman. After the funeral, Dad boasts about the huge crowd and all the nice things people had to say. I wonder which one of us is bonkers, <laughs> deciding we both must be. Our family without Mom is all wrong, like yanking the rose bush out of the garden, expecting the dandelions to carry on. Dad without Mom? Just as she predicted, a leashless dog gone mad. With mom too busy dying to keep guard, he's collected an entourage of bimbos. They beg loans, leaving him holding a bad check to be cashed as soon as. They must have a grand chuckle patting themselves on the back for sweet-talking dad yet again. Besides the loan scams, he's been robbed three times. The last one has left the family pointing fingers at each other. It is suspicious that whoever did this knew about mom's secret cupboard. But dad's boastings of location and goods leave me picturing the clientele at the Muckleshoot Casino decked out in mom's finest squash blossom necklace. Dad is an anomaly. Sometimes our phone conversations play in my head like an Abbott and Costello rerun, only less funny. Dad, what happened? You're hurt? I'm okay. It's just my face. What happened? My oxygen tank blew up. Oh, no. How? I don't know how. I was on the pot smoking a cigarette, but I've done that plenty of times. It didn't blow up. Dad, you promised not to smoke with the oxygen. How bad are you hurt? Did you call your doctor? My nose hurts the worst. Blisters are popping up all over my face. I'm not calling that damn clinic. I'm tired of them not listening to me. I'd hoped Dad would settle down with Mom's death. He has not. His pornogenarian quest <laughs> continues. 
I want him to feel love, not criticism. Some days I succeed in not judging, others I fail. I stay with him two or three days a week, cleaning and listening to his latest tales of woe. The foreclosure moves forward, dispassionately waiting for the old toothless guy in the striped overalls to slip, scaling the casino cliffs. His failed attempts at big casino wins and Danny's loan refusal have led to Plan C. Certain the Muckleshoot tribe wants his house on the corner, Dad meets with the tribal council to discuss cash. Seems apropos that the casino would own his house. He returned from the meeting offended. I don't think anyone is betting on Dad to be around long. I know it's his fault, but it's hard to respect professions that exist solely to prey on the weaknesses of others. Days when I'm stingy with grace, I imagine wheeling Dad on a gurney through the front doors of the casino, dog and oxygen tank attached, screaming, You just won the jackpot. Dad's inheritance, home, spare change, and dog. Have fun taking care of him. Have a blessed day. Not jumping down Dad's throat is my biggest challenge. I fail often, always when he tries to justify horrendous acts. The worst being the time he beat my sister Nancy. If that happened today, the doctor would not have kept quiet based on Mom's promise. It would never happen again. I can forgive the act. It's the attempts to excuse it to snatch forgiveness from my heart. What was I supposed to do? The school called, saying if she missed one more day, she wouldn't graduate. She told me to F off. She wouldn't get up. Strangely, it wasn't until seven years later that the trauma surfaced for me. In the middle of the first Rocky movie, I raced out of the theater heart pounding, gasping for air. Seeing Rocky Balboa's face after being pummeled by Apollo Creed jerked me back to that day. The shock came when I remembered Nancy's face swollen to triple its size, much worse than Rocky's mug. The day it happened, Mom met me at the door after school. She warned me that Nancy was hurt. I found her in her room, lying in bed with the lights off. When I asked what happened, she left out the curse word, but spared no detail as to the violence. According to Nancy, Dad snapped, jumping on top of her, his knees on either side of her shoulders, slugging her face, yelling, Say, Uncle. Do grown-ups even say that? I left Nancy without saying a word. Mom was locked in her room. I found Dad asleep in his recliner. As sick as it sounds, I fell at his feet, overwhelmed with pity for him. Imagine how he felt. Many years later, I confessed the feelings I had to Sandy. He said my reaction was called a trauma bond and it's not unusual for this situation and does not mean I'm a horrible person. I have forgiven him. I do forgive him. I even attended an intense workshop at our church called Surrendered Hearts, reaping much healing. It was there I formally forgave many, dad included. In every case, forgiveness stuck, except dad. I continue to forgive him daily, talking with him daily, either by phone or in person. I fail each day. The best I can do for now is not act on my resentments. When he upsets me, I pray before speaking, usually a primitive silent prayer like, Jesus, help me. When I do that, the strangest things happen. Sometimes he stops talking, as if slapped by an angel. 
Other times I find myself speaking to him with words and manners outside of my character, diffusing the conversation. There have even been times when the phone went dead mid-sentence or someone knocked on his door causing him to hang up before I could react. I'm worried the only way I'll ever be able to forgive him and have it stick is if, when, he dies. He may be a tough old bird, as the doctors refer to him, but his lifestyle keeps him dangerously close to the grave. I live for Sundays. Walking into the church with Evan never fails to renew my strength. Like dominoes falling, the logical sequence of God's grace and power line up in my mind. I'm not the woman I used to be. God changed me. If God can change me, he can do anything. Therefore, I need not worry, not even for my dad. I like the woman holding her grandson's hand, walking toward the pre-K classroom, giggling at the cardboard cutout of Jesus hiding behind the plant. I like me, the me with God. That's a miracle. If you'd asked me if you use if you'd asked me a few years ago if I wanted to sign up for a life where church day is the best day of the week and hanging with my grandson is the cherry on top, after a good laugh, I'd have disappeared. My life today is funny, but it's no joke. It's like one of the opposite day episodes Haley and Jay loved watching on Nickelodeon. I go to church more than once a week, read the Bible most days, and pray. Today, my biggest fear is that my life will go back to normal. I know that can't happen. I've given my life to Jesus. And my old self is no longer. Still, it doesn't hurt to repeat the life-saving words, relive the miracle of birth. That's why whenever Dr. Stanley asks for an altar call on CNN radio as I'm driving home from work, I repeat the words. I can't imagine God will be upset with me for surrendering my life too many times. After all, I denied him more than once. I've quit asking Sandy to come to church with us. My friends warned me that pushing too much might keep him away. Instead, they pray with me. It's just hard because I know he would love it. He thinks God only shows up at AA meetings. I want to share the place that gives me life with the man I love with all my heart. Sometimes I wonder if AA stunts his spiritual growth. They share a good intention, a good intentioned gang mentality held together with slogans, restricted and chained to what works. I'm a hypocrite for even thinking this because it was the program of Alcoholics Anonymous this softened my own heart toward God. Anyway, my case for the church is not looking good. Sandy has moved, with, moved one of his AA buds into our backyard rental house. All I know is his name is Ray. He has 14 years sobriety and he's earned Sandy's respect. He talks about him like he's one of the 12 disciples of the AA God. Ray will do whatever it takes to stay sober, even if it hurts him. He'll go to any lengths. Remember, he's the guy I told you about that went to prison when he really didn't have to because it was the right thing to do. I don't know how I feel about St. Ray living in our backyard. To be honest, I prefer Invisible Ray. The prior renters were rarely seen or heard. Ray is friendly, a little loud, and apparently incapable of allowing my preference for ignored status. <laughs> Honestly, I'm more excited about our other new addition, Gabe, a 110-pound golden lab mix 
with more character than the Three Stooges, Charlie Chaplin, and Mother Teresa combined. <laughs> I met Gabe at a party held at Sandy's ex-wife's house. Our eyes met from across the room. He quickly returned to begging for scraps, but I fell in love. He was older, wise, suave. Truth be told, he snubbed me, turning tail when I revealed empty hands. Three days after the party, Stephanie calls, asking if we would want Gabe. She said he was causing problems at her mom's, barking when left home, irritating neighbors. Bonnie, the ex, planned to take him to the pound. That night, I approached Sandy with the big question. Remember Gabe? Who? Gabe, the great dog we met at Stephanie's um, certification party. The one that kept finding ways out of the locked room to glean the guests for scraps. Big, gorgeous, brown-eyed lab mix. The one that barked when my mom stopped feeding him? Okay, yeah. Well, Bonnie is going to send him to the pound. Stephanie called to see if we could save him, take him in. Why doesn't Barney want him? He barks all day while she's at work and the neighbors are complaining. So what would be different here? We have closer neighbors than she does. That's just it. He doesn't have to stay home. He is the perfect store dog. Remember Eartha Kitty? She was great advertising for that antique store in Bellingham. Everyone remembers the store because of the cat. Yeah, when a giant barking dog scares the socks off our customers, they'll remember to never come back. I know I can train him to greet customers and not bark. Obviously, if he had to stay home by himself, we'd have to find him a different home. Can we just give him a try? After all, I was able to train Bonnie's ex-husband. Don't you think I can handle her ex-dog? <laughs> ha ha, funny. I don't know. He's old. Do we ha want to go through that again? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, my chapter 52, we're, uh, well, uh, with Deb uh, finding a church and uh, the community, the church community, and becoming part of, and uh, she has changed completely. And the former relationship with her dad that uh, was pretty much void before that. And uh, then the scary thought of him coming to live with us is kind of addressed in my chapter. And uh, <laughs> yeah, and some more about the big yellow dog that uh, turned out to be the greatest dog I've ever been around. And uh, Deb was right. <laughs> <laughs> Deb's right way too often. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, uh, the end of this chapter talks about uh, me possibly giving church a chance. It always tells the end. Have you noticed that? Uh, what? You always tell the end. You're spoiling. Yeah, again, Deb was right. <laughs> <laughs> I hate that. <laughs> so I'm going to read chapter 52. Why don't you just read the end? Huh? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> don't let the dog trick me. Got it. <laughs> we dodged a bullet. Better said, we dodged a nuclear bomb named Mac. Deb wanted to move him into our house. She asked permission. I could have said no, but I said yes. We even made plans. The office will be gutted and transformed into a bedroom. In my defense, she posed polar statements that only a two-year-old has rights to deny. 
You understand it's the right thing to do, to honor my father, be a loving example for him. I squeaked out, yes. <laughs> the fallout from the blast surfaced. Thank you. I know it's a huge sacrifice. This is the only way Dad won't have to be separated from Cody. That dog, too? But I hate that dog! <laughs> oh, for the next week, I carried the burden of my future, picturing life with Mac and Cody ruling my home. I spoke with my sponsor, hoping he'd give me permission to renege my promise based on the Dog from Hell clause. He did not. I prayed for God to not let this happen. Then I prayed for God's will to be done, ready to accept life on life's terms. The following weeks continued as usual with Deb splitting her time between home in Yakima, business in Ellensburg, and Mac in Auburn. Then one day it fell apart or came together. I'm not sure which. Deb came back the same day she'd left for her three-day caretaking with Mac. I'm not going back to Dad's, not on a regular basis. I realize he just wants me to clean up his messes so he can stay out all night like some college kid in a dorm. I'm not angry with him. Instead, I feel released. He's made it clear he does not want to live with us or any family member. I need to let him do what he needs to do. Trust God is taking care of him. Her, her words feel like a warm, soothing shower of relief. She seems okay. I know she's disappointed in Mac. She's been waiting for Mac to change into the man she thinks he should be, the dad she wants him to be. Not long after Deb's epiphany, Mac surprised us all driving over Chinook Pass on a Sunday morning, dressed in his best Roy Rogers-style church attire. Only Jesus himself could have excited Deb more. I knew which gears were turning in her mind, jumping from Dad attending church to St. Mac of the Muckleshoot Casino in two seconds flat. Before leaving for the service, Deb peeks around the corner behind her dad motioning for me to follow her. Upstairs, I sneak away, leaving four-year-old Evan to answer Mac's question. How many girlfriends do you have? Can you believe this? He drove all the way here to go to church. You don't understand. He's going to love our church. When he sees that we have a band, he'll be blown away. When they return home, Deb's spirits have deflated. Later, she says he liked the band, but he had embarrassed her. Something about flirting with the worship leader, telling her what a beautiful voice she had, and suggesting she might be good enough to sing in a real band. Exasperated, Deb added. He asked her if she ever threw in a non-religious song. <laughs> and I managed not to laugh. I escaped suicide by standard poodle. I knew Mac would never want to live with us, but fear of what if fear of what if ruled my nerves. I may have been granted an in run play with Mac, but somehow we are once again dog owners. When Deb called Stephanie to decline the dog based on his elder status, she re she laughed. Gabe is only two years old. I thought it was off the hook when we agreed the dog was too old. Who would have thought a young dog, a golden lab chow mix, could be so laid back and wise to the finer things in life? Like naps. I feel duped. But it won't happen again. Deb promised we'd find a new home for the dog if he flunks greeting 101. According to her, after three days with Gabe at the store, he's ready to open his own shop. I'm the one who needs instructions. When you get to the store, first thing, get his tie out of the storeroom. Are you listening? Yeah. He loves it. Trust me. Then leave the front door open, as we always do, but keep the back door closed. 
He knows he can go out, of, out the back door, but he won't take one step over the front threshold. You won't believe how quickly he learned. What if a squirrel walks by? Would you listen, please? When a customer walks in, he'll get up and go greet them. He won't bark? Only at the UPS guy. We're working on that. After he greets them, he'll come ask you for a treat. Only give him one, and only if he greets them. Oh, also, don't let him trick you into giving him one per person. It's one per group, okay? Yeah, I should write that down. Don't let the dog trick me. Got it. <laughs> the dog is great, smarter than most. Still, I'm not buying the executive greeter employee of the month hype. It didn't help that when I'm on my day to work with him, the first thing he does is jump in the driver's seat of my truck. As Deb waves us off to work like tots on their first day of school, I ask, shall I drive or did you teach him that also? <laughs> Driving the Yakima River Canyon Road, I nearly forget my passenger. But when the rolling river is in view from the road, Gabe nudges my arm and whines. He might be an okay dog, tagging along on fishing trips. I'm not fluent in dog ease, as Deb seems to be, but even I understand the snorts mean, hey, let's get out of the vehicle and play in the water. <laughs> for giving a bad bout of gas, for giving a bad bout of gas, he's an okay carpool buddy. Once at the store, he follows me into the storeroom just as Deb said he would. Amused, I hold up his necktie as I've been instructed. He approaches, tail wagging. Skeptical, I hold the tie open, and to my amazement, he sticks his head through the pre-tied loop. He's one, on, he's one up on me with a tie since I've always balked at the idea. Struck, strutting off, head held high, like he's late for a board meeting, Gabe positions himself in the front of the door. Leary, I opened it as instructed and command him to take a nap. He obeys. Naps and fishing may well be our bond. <laughs> I'm flipping on the last light switch when the first customer walks through the door. I'm braced, ready to call an ambulance if she kneels over from fright, keels over from fright, when greeted by a giant barking dog. Instead, he gets up, saunters over to the lady, tail swaying gently, giving and receiving a warm welcome. He walks to the counter, gives me a commanding look, waiting for me to pay up with a treat for a job well done. Momentarily, I suspect Deb is hiding around the corner with a remote control device. This continued all day with every customer, man, woman, or child. He did have two forgivable barking episodes, when the UPS guy rushed in, startling him awake, and at me when I could not get down off a 14-foot ladder to pay him his treat fast enough. <laughs> Sheep sheepishly, I admit, Deb is right. <sighs> Gabe quickly becomes our poster boy, his photo on business cards, ads, even flyers for those wanting a souvenir of the big yellow dog. Really appears as if this dog loves his job. I even tested the tie attraction, purposely forgetting to get it off the hook the next time I worked with him. He stood at the storeroom door, staring at me, looking like you'd imagine if a dog could tap his foot or paw. When I did not respond, he snorted, followed by a one-bark command, meaning, <clears throat> Did you forget something? I don't know if I'm enamored with Gabe or Deb, as Deb is, but he's... I don't know if I'm as enamored with Gabe as Deb is, but he's proven to be worth his annoyances, i.e. he's stretching out over the entire truck seat on the way home, huge head in my lap, snorting and occasionally spewing lethal gas. He is fast becoming a draw to our store, tagging us as the antique store with a big yellow dog in a tie. There's only two things that make me regret having this dog. 
and they both have to do with Deb's big mouth. One, she makes it known to all that I didn't think he would make a good store dog, and two, she has a new story she tells to whomever will stand still. Have I told you where we got Gabe? He belonged to Sandy's ex-wife. She was going to take him to the pound. I thought, hmm, the husband worked out. Why not give the dog a shot? <laughs> Insert out of control laughter at one's own joke. <laughs> <laughs> Why does she think that is so funny? <laughs> Meantime, life is shaping up. When trouble knocks, we work it out. Move on. I'm glad it's less complicated between us as our family progresses. Annette married three years now, gave birth last spring to our second grandson, my biological first, Matthew James McFerrin. Although his birth cooperated with her life itinerary, I chuckle knowing the lesson's coming. Babies won't abide by mommy, mommy engineer's blueprints. Even so, she's the most well-read mom on earth tackling motherhood the same way as her studies at MIT. Her mom's style is best described as conserge rather than mother hen. As a child, whether at school or home, Nanette would speak up for her sister, instructing teachers or sitters as to the idiosyncrasies of Stephanie's likes and dislikes. Mostly, she mandated just put ketchup on it, and she'll eat it. <laughs> it's great the Palmer Namer will carry on. But honestly, that's not my thing. What's val what value is a name floating on if the kid doesn't know who I am? That's what's important to me. I want this brown-eyed, super-sized baby uh -oh. to know me. I think we just got bumped off. I don't know if it'll come back on. Should I keep going? I don't know. Oh. No, we got to figure out what to do. We're not on. Um, I think I better. Well, it says we're. We might lose the whole video. I really don't know what to do. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I hope we're not on. We might, I mean, it'd be great if we were on, but Ah, uh, let's see if anybody's let us know. Oh, Mark wanted you to... Normal in our family. I have a new shirt. Grab the mouse every day, and if he doesn't... Okay. Um... I'm not sure what to do. Um... I wonder how long ago that was. Oh, goodness. Um. Look at, we're still going, but there's no, oh, he said yes, okay. <laughs> All right, well, we're gonna finish. We It, it looks like uh, we're yeah, we cut don't off. Know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I want this brown-eyed, super-sized baby to know me. Another change is Deb's attitude to our new backyard tenant, Ray. Even before Ray offered to paint our two-story home in exchange for rent, she had grown fond of him. Now his name links in conversation with the words blessing, God sin, answer to prayer. Our two-toned, drab brown, chippy paint home 
was one task Deb and I were not up to, both of us being lousy painters, I admit her prayers to have the house painted and Ray, professional painter, dropping into our rental might be beyond coincidence. Deb's prejudiced views of the cookie cutter AA guy are being challenged. It's not fair to say he's anti, she's anti-AA. On the contrary, she is humbly grateful for the program and for those who take it seriously. However, her patience bleeds out over those in the program who are long on talk, talking and short on walking it out. In her words, If they perform the slightest act of service, they go on and on, flying a banner across the sky, riding home to mommy, banging cymbals. Hello, world. Please take note. I took out the garbage, poured coffee, held the door for the person behind me. Ray has good exposure for Deb, modeling the principles without the self-back padding. Self-back padding. <laughs> He's solid. In Deb's words, Ray is capable of doing a good deed without a parade and a clown to scoop poop behind him. With our life bursting with blessings, I decided we should do some service together as a couple. Months ago, months ago maybe closer to a year, Deb stopped asking me to go to church. But this time, I surprised her, offering to go with her to serve dinner to the homeless on Thanksgiving Day. The dinner is at the church, but that's not like partaking in the whole we're all holier than thou Sunday celebration. The church building is amazing. Oak beams, stained glass windows, 20 foot tall oak sliding partition doors, and 100 rooms. I expected to find a group of elderly women cooking and swapping kitchen war stories. Instead, I am greeted by a smiling late 30s male reeking with nice really nice guy character really nice guy character <laughs> hey you must be sandy nice to meet you i'm wayne had i not known the name wayne purdom it would prove i never listened since he's mentioned at least once a week <laughs> back when she was running a vigorous campaign for my church attendance she called him a man's man she is not an expert on this topic so it didn't mean much when I commented on the architecture, Wayne took off his apron, deserting a sink full of spuds waiting to be peeled, and took me on a guided tour of the building. I nearly forgot he's a pastor. After the tour, ten or so of us cooked and served dinner for thirty people. It was fun, and I didn't feel out of place. The weirdest part of all is that Deb didn't say anything about it, not during or after not one, I told you so. Or, now will you go to church? I'll say this. If I was going to attend church, this might be okay. <laughs> well, I don't know if we had problems or not with the uh, video. Yeah. I hope you heard us if you didn't. Uh, well, Mark uh, said that um, uh, we were still on. So. I can see him. He's, uh, yeah. Uh, my shirt says, uh, sawdust. Is man glitter. Man glitter, <laughs> yeah. Mark. I'm sure you have some of that too. Yeah, you've you had lots of that. Okay, mm -hmm. so if you want a chance Thanks. to win a copy of this book, yeah. um, Chicken Soup for the Soul, 101 Feel Good Stories, share this video um, on Facebook. If you watch this later, you can share it then, and we kind of try to keep track of that. And then we put your name in a list, mm -hmm. and when we get some names... We draw a name out. Yeah, and there's a story in here by one of my favorite, my most favorite author. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, Deb wrote a story that's in this book. It's pretty cool. So, uh, if you want a copy, share us. Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, See you next week. How, how many more weeks? Two more weeks. Two more yeah. weeks. All right. Okay. Thanks for being with us. All right. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Good, Good night. night.